Hello and welcome back to another episode of Lead to Excel podcast. And today I have a dear friend and sister with me, and I'm actually really excited about this episode. It's one that everyone needs to listen to, and one that I would say, everyone listening, share, 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 share. You will get to know why where we start this podcast. So, Denise Edger, it's a pleasure and it's an honor to have you on the podcast today. Thanks so much for saying yes. Thank you, Maureen. It's very nice to be here. I'm not very familiar with podcasts, but one of the good things about it is I appreciate this. I am humbled to be asked to do this. Um, I always say to people, life is not a right. So... I don't think this is a right. It's a privilege. So thank you for the privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Denise, I'm going to, let's start by um, introducing you. If I will start by saying that Denise and I went secondary school together. So we're secondary school sisters. So we go back a long, long way. And it's been great to reconnect again, you know, after so many years apart. So Denise, can you tell us a bit about your background, what you do? Um, I know one of the things that that we love talking about as well is our passion for education so if you just tell us a bit about you that would be awesome thank you so my name is denise ejo um i am of nigerian heritage i grew up in nigeria i was born in nigeria i met maureen in nigeria in our class um in lagos so Everything about me is very, very Nigerian. Um, I live in the UK now, but different things and different journeys have taken me a long way. So who am I? I am an educationist. So I am, and I t- I am proudly a teacher. That is who I am. And that's what I always say to people. Every other accolade you get on the teaching career is as a result of being a teacher but you grow, go up the ladder and get other skills that take you to different places. Um, what else have I got? I am the CEO of a foundation, and that is as a result of living with cancer. So to be able to marry my life and make things meaningful, because life should be meaningful, I've put the two together, and I now work on both um, both. I have two sets of skill sets that I think are important in in changing the positive, in making us understand that our positive mindsets are key in anything we do. In that light, I will say, what's my education background? What am I interested in? I'm very, I'm into the education more than, my cancer is my charity. My education is my career, is my profession. I uh, am very involved in consultancy across not just Nigeria, but very many places. In fact, I've just been told yesterday that I may have a project in Tanzania and I will go. And that's going to fascinate you when you get to really know who I am, that what does she mean she's going off to Tanzania? But I'm going off to Tanzania and I am looking forward to it. Anything to educate the children of this generation and give them the tools to excel is central to whoever Dennis Uzoma Ejo is. And that's it. Dennis, your name is Uzoma. That is my new middle name as well. I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. That is amazing. That is great. So oh. we're namesakes. That is oh, so see that's how fantastic. Life goes. Exactly. I actually didn't know that. So that's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Denise. I think, you know, one of the things that I would say is that you are just an incredible woman in what you do. And it's, you know, how you mentioned that you're living with cancer and you're truly living with it um, in the sense of even how you go through life and everything you do. So I just want us to kind of go back a bit. So you started off as, you know, well, started off as teaching. What did you study at uni? Okay, so oh, that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't want to talk too much. That's why I didn't go there. I went to university in in a town in Nigeria called Sokoto. Now, 
My degree is very funny. My degree is University of Sokoto. But the university today is called Usman Danfodio University. So, because I, grad- I was the last graduating set under the University of Sokoto name. Yeah. Um, I studied business management, majoring in finance. I went on, um, I'm, I think I would like to say now, to be honest, hands out, I get bored. I went on to do a master's in advanced information technology here in the UK. And my mom said, you know what, why don't you just go and be a teacher so you could have time to spend with your children because your life just seems to be about them. So I decided, okay, let me go and try this teaching thing. And the first day I walked in to a classroom to observe, I heard a a child swear at a teacher Mm. and I flew to the door I was at the back and I ran to the door I was like oh my goodness what's going on here and the way she handled it I was not happy and I just Mm. said to myself now if this is what it is I want to be a teacher because children have to be taught the skill sets to be successful in life and we don't we are not supposed to mother cuddle them but rather teach them to be good at what they have so find their strengths and use it and that's how I enjoyed and became a teacher. I rose all through the ranks till I became a head of schools, which means I was leading a group of schools. Um, with two different sets, one, one, one in Lagos, one in Mina. But the schools were like five different schools with three different curriculums. In that time, I was, I had a headache and ended up finding myself with, cancer so I live with cancer so Mm. I want to stop because this is the education part yeah yeah thank you very much for that so you then discovered how long ago did you did was the diagnosis for cancer made how long ago has this been we're in year eight so um, I was seven years last August we're now in year eight right okay Thank you very much. So let's now talk about your journey, you know, living with cancer and um, what you found out. Because one of the things that I just find incredible is is how much awareness you're raising about living with cancer and actually the diagnosis. So if you kind of talk us through what what cancer is this and if you give us your journey of, you know, a bit of what happened, how it was diagnosed and how you came to i think what i'm interested in is how did you get to the point of of of, you know it's almost like accepting that okay this is what it is and now this is what i'm going to do to give back to help so i'm looking at more your mind what happened when it was diagnosed and how was that journey um, okay for you so i'm going to start and at a point i'm going to stop so that you can rephrase it and I'm going when I get to that point, I'm going to tell you why I had to stop. Okay. okay but let's yeah, go. Sure. So I was I was working, um, like I said, um, I was heading a group of schools and I enjoy traveling. At that time Nigeria is very safe. So I just used to get on the train or get um sorry, get on the bus um tra- and flights all around Nigeria as I did. And I kept having a persistent headache. And I had a headache, I would I got to a point where I was taking a very strong drug called Cathagot for the headache. And I couldn't understand. And I kept saying, why do I have the headache? At a point, we got tested with my ears because they used to hurt. Um, my They said there was nothing wrong with my ears. Of course, there was nothing wrong with my ears because by the time I got diagnosed, it was a different journey. I had this headache, it wasn't going. So in the end, I went, I'd had, I'd been to six different hospitals. Now, six very good hospitals. So I'm not going to sit here and say they were not good or they didn't know their job because even when I took the same diagnosis to the UK, I still had a similar reaction. Um, I did it and then I was fortunate. A man, a family friend of mine said, come, let's go and see this doctor. He's, he's in town now. And let's see what he has. He has to say he's part of a hospital. So I went, I paid was my bills. In the UK? As in Nigeria. Okay. And in, 
and he said to me, Denise, look, everything about you is fine. Now, this is the same conversation six hospitals had told me. So, you know, mm. you hold on even though your instincts telling you is not. And please bear in mind, I didn't say this, but my mom had died of cancer 10 months before. So my mom died in October. Oh, 10 months and before. Diagnosed, yes, and I'm being diagnosed oh. with cancer uh, um, yeah. 10 months after. So, but I somehow knew. And I'm going to talk about my mom a lot because she influences a lot of my story today. Mm. So I said, okay, fine. I then did the, I did, the man did this test, everything. He said, there's nothing wrong, but you know what? We have an MRI scanning machine that has been brought into the hospital. I would like you to do an MRI scan to your brain. If that is clear, then I can guarantee you I'm not going ahead with anything else. You are fine. Mm. Of course it wasn't clear. As soon as I walked in there, <laughs> the guy halfway through they came in and said, "We need to put." They do, they don't use contrast; they use the word dye, something mm -hmm. different, into mm -hmm. your hand. And they start to explain all this. I can't hear because I have an excruciating headache, and honestly, to lie on that bed was just not my 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 cup of tea for that day. And then I said, "What's the problem?" And they said, "Well, we can see something. You see." They don't want to tell me what you can see. I said, okay. And they did all the scans and they said, we can see um, a few tumors. I think that was the word. So that's what the word they used. They used a different word, mm -hmm. where it's tumor. Mm -hmm. we knew it was but at the time, that was not the word they used. I said, okay. And as soon as I walked away, I knew I had a, I knew I had a big problem. It was summertime. I work in Nigeria, but I live in the UK. So mm -hmm. I had an expected contract. I was coming home for summer. I said to my youngest daughter, I said, well, are you coming to England with me? She said, no, I'm not coming with you. Um, just buy my stuff here. And she'd give me on her shopping list. So I thought, okay, now that we've got a problem now, let's see. I said, I'll get my results the next day. And I walked in to pick up the thing and he had the disc of the pictures and my scan. Mm -hmm. And the report. And I opened the envelope and it said cancer. And it had this list of different types of cancers because you know once they now say cancer, then it has to be they have to say because they've actually done this scan, what do they think it could be? What kind of cancers? Mm -hmm. And it had different kinds of cancers. And at the bottom somewhere along it, I scanned and I saw three three months left, three months to live. And I thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought to myself, all right, I'm coming. <laughs> it's all right now. I said mm -hmm. to my friends, I got home and I was still trying to get my leave allowance from my office, which I hadn't got for my ticket. I just called a few of my friends and I said, you know, I need to get out of Nigeria now. I need to go back home. I need to go back to England. Mm -hmm. And two days later, a few of my friends immediately put the money together and my ticket was gotten that night and I flew out the following morning. Now, now that I knew what was wrong with me, you have yeah. to understand, you cannot allow the airline to know that they're carrying mm -hmm. a passenger like this. So I didn't even go there. Mm. And I started my mm. journey in the UK. Even the first day I went in to see the consultant um, in a and &E, because I was referred by my GP at this point now mm. to a and &E. As soon as I got in to see my consultant at my a and &E, um, he said, no, 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 just give her some hair painkiller. She's fine. You see, this was the statement oh. everybody kept saying. Yes, yeah. the doctor I met in here and he said, no, I'm not, I, I don't think so. She doesn't sound like somebody that doesn't know that she's ill. There's something wrong and she's trying to say, find it. And then he said, okay, just do a CT scan. Now, I need an MRI scan. He said, let's do yeah. a CT scan. Um, anyway, they did the whole thing and I was trying to come before I left the room to come down to the reception where they wheeled me back. You know, they wheeled me up to take the scan and then they wheeled me back. They told them to take me back up again and now they want an MRI. I didn't even mm. realize that during that period they had contacted immediately. Um, it's a group of hospitals that do, deal with brain, 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 brain tumors, and they uh -huh, have contact with uh -huh. them with the brain tumors. It's called South East, South London 
South East. It's a group that they are the ones that every person that has a tumor in the UK in this in this mm. group are under this clinic, and it's not just about London. So it's so London at that point, country. why did they contact them? Wait, because they hadn't saw. done the MRI. No, but they saw that there was a problem. They could see there was ah, a problem. So they were already suspecting. So they now needed to confirm whether okay. what they were seeing was exactly correct. Because okay. Okay. The, the person was told, do a CT scan. But, you know, you will see some parts. And okay. then they saw. They were like, no. So they said, go and now do a, form, a proper MRI. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I got admitted that day. And I got admitted because mm. apparently my brain was full of liquid at that time. I think I call it water. I don't know what it's called medically. Yeah. I always say I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a teacher. So just bear with me on that yeah. one. Yeah. So yeah. Let's, not, let's not become medical because we know medical cancer. technical. <laughs> and then I did that. And as soon as I did that, they said they put me in the bed, and that was it. They now had to get the swelling down. But in, I was then put in straight into brain surgery within, it, it was supposed to be the following week, but there was a mix up in the hospital and then it was done two weeks later and I had a brain scan, a brain surgery. So very sad, sad yeah. very good, but it was the day before my daughter's birthday. You know, I left her in Nigeria and went off telling her I'll see you soon, um, not knowing I would not see her soon. So I got back had the surgery. It was very funny because on the day I went for the surgery, I was in a high. I, and I, I think I want to say, surgeries do not throw me. So I always tell people, mm. don't be scared of it and then you tend to be okay. But in the same way, my, beep, my, my pressure, I don't know if it's pulse, one of them is always very low. It's always below the norm for a normal person. And I've always known that. Mm. It's the same way I've always known my BP is always low. It's not high. But now it's not like that. It's changed. <laughs> but there's, that's how we started. And then I started my cancer journey. Um, immediately after that, they had the first brain surgery. As they were finishing the first brain surgery, they had found um, another doctor, another consultant. I don't know if I want to name their names, but they're great consultants in the UK. The second one mm -hmm. was gave me from, from his budget because I now had to have gamma knife surgery. And that consultant was a research consultant. So yeah. he had a budget. And the budget allowed me to have gamma knife surgery with now removed the other surrounding tumors because at that mm -hmm. point they knew I had four so I had four tumors in the brain. So with me now learning mm -hmm. about cancer, I realized that if you had one tumor in your brain, you do not have you may or may not have cancer. If you have multiple tumors in your brain, you do have cancer. It's now what cancer mm -hmm. you have. Yeah. yeah. I had the first two, and they came back and said it was reading breast cancer. But it had it was what? breast cancer. Oh, it was primarily breast cancer. Okay. okay. Primary, it's a primary. I have what you call yeah. metastatic breast cancer. Breast cancer, which means yeah. It's breast cancer that has moved to the brain. Yes, so all the tumors yeah, are yeah. in the brain. After that, yeah. I had to have the gamma knife surgery. And then I was given some time while they were still trying to work out. I had to do all the other pet, PET scan to check had it spread all over my organs, mm -hmm. where it was it, how did it get there. I'm not sure if anybody can really answer that now, but at mm -hmm. least we've been able to find drugs that allow me life. I then have so yeah. since then I have had three. I think they are called cranotomies. That means three cuts in the brain. The brain um, yeah. I have had two gamma knife surgeries. Um, so between those two, they have removed nine tumors from my brain. I have wow. changed chemotherapy drugs that continue to shrink or remove other tumors and stop others from growing now mm. i am on i will when i say i some a person living with cancer that statement means the person lives with cancer and mm -hmm. they will not they will live they will die living with cancer mm. so a lot of people when they hear it think oh you mean it will get better no 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 
it's the it's the one cancer category of people that the disease does not is never cured. Mm. Um, ever where it goes, once they always have a drug to keep you, they will. The side effects yeah. of the drug, however, is known in the cancer space to be the real reason why people struggle because um, mm-hmm. the challenge mm-hmm. drug is a lot. Yeah. Um, let me stop yeah. here. Okay. Okay. Thanks so so much. Sorry. To give you something else to think about. Okay. No. Thank you so much for really sharing that. And um, I think uh, what the question I was going to ask was, so is the tumors do they keep growing back? Is that why you you keep having the operation? Is it and also because when you say you're living with it, is it that more tumors keep coming? How what's happening there? Because the tumors keep going back. Okay, so in the process of having the surgery, as there's a there's a site, the original site mm-hmm. is is active. So I have an active tumor site, and there's nothing they can do about it. So I've had three yeah. cuts. I've had I've had three cuts. I have one more chance at a gamma knife. I don't know how many more chances I will get on a cranotomy if it's at the same spot, because it's the same cut point that is is still the same point. It's not moved. So I'm not sure yet how that goes. But as of my my results as of yesterday, that's one that has been and it's just not moving. It's just um, it's respecting as far as I say, I would say like this, it's respecting itself. Good, <laughs> it's, okay. it's allowing me to tell it just stay where you are. And yeah. don't make anything worse. I just don't exactly. need it. Yeah, good. And in, I hope by God's grace it will stay like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So, and yeah. Denise, with all this, you know, this experience, in fact, the interesting thing is you were told three months in Nigeria, but, you know, we thank God that you're still here to give, the, to give your story almost eight years in. How has that journey been for you mentally? And, you know, if I come back to that early stage, um, what were the emotions you were going through and how did you navigate through it? Thank you. Now that's where we are. That's now the discussion. So one of the things I'll say very quickly is that when I got, I have a, I have a, a, a spiritual relationship. I, I believe in God. I trust God and I have my own spiritual lifestyle. So I thought to myself, well, how am I going to navigate this? Because I knew now I had multiple tumors. So one day I sat in my brother's house and I thought, I was sitting there because I couldn't be on my own. I would fall off. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I thought, what is this all about? So I prayed and I said, Father, if this disease, if this illness is going to kill me quickly. It's going to kill me in a space of maybe a year. I don't want it. Mm. Let me just go home quietly. The disease is called cancer. And I accept. My mother just died of cancer. I did not believe that my children had a right to watch what I had to watch when my mom died. And my mom died as an elderly person. I am quite young and I had a child in secondary school from one, so just one. Yeah, and that makes a difference. Yeah, uh-huh. um, um, what's that thing for? Key stage, key stage four, you're not, you're seven. So you have to be yeah. very, very mindful. You have to look at where your child is. And that was what I thought. I said, however, if I am going to live, if the decision is for me to live, and this is my prayer request, let me be useful mm. to society. And let me be able to work for people with cancer. And let my life be used for that. And I left. And one day in my chemo chair, I had some guests because we used to be allowed to go, have family and friends. And I used the opportunity to start encouraging people who had heard about cancer, who I knew 
could have a voice or help people. If they wanted, they could visit me on my chemo chair. We have a chat. They could take photos. Because a lot of people do not understand chemo. So a lot of people think it's very complex. We have to be admitted. We're, we're all, no, we don't. We go in there. We have our chemo. We walk out of there. We don't sleep there. Mm -hmm. They're not well. They're not going to do chemo. So that's so. I want that notion erased now. If anybody is going to have chemo, you don't sleep there. They will not even give you chemo if you are not well. Yeah. So don't worry about it. Chemo is not, don't worry about chemo. It's not scary. It shouldn't be. It's just, a, it's like a drip and that's it. So I started to use that to talk about it. And one day they were sitting there and said, you know what, Denise, you've always wanted a foundation. Why don't you use your life to start this foundation? And that's how I started my foundation. My comus is actually my grandfather's name. That's my that's my mom's oh. maiden name. My grandmother died of cancer. My mother mm. died of cancer. What cancer did your mother die of? My one the, the one died. Uh, now I don't know the order, but one died with. Both of them died of leukemia. It's the type of leukemia. one died right. with non okay. one died with non Hodgkin's, something okay. like that. Yeah. But I don't have either of that. That's not what yeah. I have. Yeah. I have metastatic breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so after that, now, I have to be very honest with you, the journey of a cancer person, person short term or long term, is very complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you mean and by if that? All the, if all the components are not provided for, the survival yeah. rate of a cancer patient is almost null and tr truly is not existent. In this, what am I trying to say? I am very dependent on all the service provisions that a cancer patient requires. Mm. Our biggest challenge is our mental health. And that's one part that people do not realize. If that is wrong, no matter how hard you try, something will trigger and you won't be able to fight anymore. Can I, can I, um, ex I want us to kind of dig a bit deeper into this, um, into this aspect, Denise, because I think it's so important um, in terms of the mental health. And, what, you know, when you say mental health, what do you actually mean um, by that? That's why I was wanted to list them, because then you will see the relationship. So we've got the mental yeah. health, we've got our physical being. Yeah. Cancer treatment comes with pain. Mm -hmm. So when there's pain, you know it will go into your brain. Mm -hmm. No matter how hard you try to not recognize that, it is going to be there. You were living a very normal life before you got sick. All of a sudden, your world's crashed. Your emotional well-being is crashed. You were living, you were living a normal life, you could pay your bills. Your financial well-being has crashed. How are you going to navigate? So that is, then you start to think about everything. So that's why mental is an encompassment of all what I've just mentioned. There's no, you can't separate them. So I wouldn't want anybody to separate them. So one of the first things I realized as I was journeying, I have come to realize that when I'm in pain or I'm tired, I will cry. Mm -hmm. And I don't need, and one of the things I, I in fact, I use this to, when you're supporting a cancer patient, one thing people say is, it is well. No, it's not well. So please don't take mm -hmm. it. Or I understand. No, you don't understand because you're not sitting in the chair. That's so right. vocabulary needs to change globally. You need to understand that the pain, the experience, the way we feel, the way we move, the way we think has changed and we don't know how to navigate. So when I say we don't, we really don't. We are now dependent on trusting people to respect our, our space. What do I mean by that? You talked about, you're asking me mental health. Mm. I depend on the counsellor. In fact, I had to cancel my counsellor's appointment yesterday because I am not well for tomorrow, for next week. 
Why do I have to do that? Because I have a lot of things I need to get off my head now. We've just gone through Christmas. And if I don't sort those things out, I will not navigate 2024. Yeah. And I'm one person I beg a lot of cancer patients, take your counseling sessions seriously. Source for it and get it. Because if you don't get it, you wouldn't know what to do. I got to a point where at the point of five years, I didn't think I was going to cross the line. Not because anybody said anything, not because of anything, but statistically, I'm not supposed to get past five years because I have metastatic yeah. breast cancer. So we have to come to terms with what you have. You can't, don't live in a box and lie about it. Deal with it. I don't want you to lie about it. You've got the disease, face it head on and seek for the help you require. Please don't, 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 don't do that because it's not going to help you. And I had to go through that and understand where I was coming from. So when I got through that, we, that, that period was COVID time. I was just spiraling down. He said, hello, Denise, I will cry. What's going on? I didn't know. How was I going? I didn't, I couldn't understand. But one thing I only knew I did right was I didn't want my child, my youngest child to know mm. how I was broken. My two other children are married and they were not around. So I only had her. And it was COVID. Mm. Gradually, I have family, they come, they go. And then I got the counselor. And the best thing that's ever happened to me was she mm. helped me to put all these finances, mental health, uh, emotional well being, physical well being, mm. in boxes. Because you come out of one, another one's going to happen if you live with the disease. If you have the disease, some people have cancer and they get cured and they move on. And then you start a life again and you go for your screening every year. For anybody who has ever had cancer, I'm going to say it again. For anybody who has ever had cancer, you will always have a screening every year. Right? And once you have a screening every year, it means automatically that they're going to check let me tell you now, immediately that screening is called. Every mm. part of your body that you think has cancer automatically somehow has starts to have cancer. Not yeah. because it does, but because your mental state is telling you yes. they're going to see yeah. And there's yeah. nothing you can do about it. So mm. just take it like that. And it's that time of screening and scanning. I have scans three times a year. Trust me, I know what it is when I go there. And I just sit down and I'm like, whatever we're going to see how it comes out but that's one for five when i was at the five year point i couldn't think like that i yeah. was broken i was shattered i was exhausted and i still get to that point now so if you've got cancer or you're going through it just find someone you trust that will not judge you that is just willing to listen to you, not talk to you or advise you because nobody can advise you unless they're on that chair. But at least they can listen to you and ask them, what do you want me to do for you? Yeah. Not, like not to give us what you think you're going to do for us. No. Yeah. Ask, what would you want me to Sometimes mm. I say to people, just taking a cancer patient out of their home and have a meal with them you will be so surprised the positive mental state you have you have done you you will be shocked in nigeria one of the things we do in my foundation we we once did we just started it i've never done it before but buy food wrap it package it nicely and give it to some because they mm. have they have to mm. eat there's, there's mm. certain things that we have to eat if we as a cancer patient say we don't want to eat something, please don't tell us, well, we're supposed to eat greens, we're supposed to eat beans, we're not supposed to. No, don't, no, 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 don't, don't do that. Don't do that, please, because you, all you're doing is not giving us a reason to live. Because yeah. if we don't, we cannot take our medicines. Mm -hmm, and our medicines mm -hmm. are very, very harsh. Let's put things in context. 
let's be honest about it. If our medicine, our medicines are harsh, it's because of medicines I actually use a walking stick. I am mm. learning already to understand that I may end up in a wheelchair. So, am I going to sit now and say, I don't know that? No, I am already aware that it can happen. Mm. I'm starting to learn to I navigate when I go to the airport. Now I seek assistance. I'm no longer trying to say, I'm macho, I'm going to walk. That's what my counselor has been teaching me. There's no need doing that anymore. Just seek the help and move on. Don't, don't, yeah. don't, don't, please. Let me stop here. Oh, Denise, that is so, I've just been making notes. That is fantastic. And there are a few things you touched on that I love. The vocabulary that is used um, when talking to someone that has cancer is so important. And, you know, coming back to that mental state, like you said, there's a lot that you're having to think about and deal with. So, you know, what we don't, what you don't want is the additional things that will create more problems with mental health. And I think that's so important. If one of the things you said, or two things that I would love to mention is that come to terms with what you have. I think that's so powerful because once you do that, it's almost like instead of being in denial, you know, in the brain, there's an alignment. So this alignment with this is the reality of what's happening. And the, so now with that, your, your brain is able to almost open up to opportunities, to things you can do. But when you're in denial, that is when there's a misalignment and then the problem starts. So I, that's so powerful. Something else you said is, what do you want me to do for you? Wow. I think that is just great because a lot of times people don't know what to say how to say it or what not to say. So I think this is just great. Listening, just listen, just be there. And, you know, asking the question, what do you want me to do? Because you're right. A lot of times we assume we know. And we do this with, with people generally. It's like, you know what the other person needs because you're basing it on your own needs or what you think. But we've got to really understand that we're all different. So asking that question, because and each and different, you know, cancer patients are all different. They will need different things. Human beings are different and we will all need different things. So just asking that question, I, I just, you know, thank you so much. And something else you said that I just want to reiterate again is just taking someone out, you know, a patient, someone living with cancer, just taking them out and saying, see, let's go for a meal. Let's just change the environment. Little things like that make a whole lot of difference than coming to impose your thoughts about your fine. Oh, don't say that. Oh, that's too negative. Oh, don't do that. You know, but really allowing them be, you know, and just it's almost like creating a space for them to, you know, appreciate life instead of yeah, it's, it's, almost it's taking a safe it away. Space. Our safe yes, space. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's really that's really great. Thank you so much. A lot of if I'm, if I'm listening to you, I'm going, wow, yeah, I think you know it's just fantastic. So um Denise, I, now that I want to talk about your charity, um, in terms of what it does and how you know, I know you've touched on it a bit, you know, how you support people with food and you know, support people in different ways. But what tell us a bit more about the charity. Um, cause that would help as well. Okay. My charity is called Cornwood Cancer Foundation and it's an awareness foundation. We don't fundraise to help people with treatment. And that is for ethical reasons. I live with the disease and I always say to people who don't understand the cancer space, every person that is cancer has cancer long-term Cancer patients are the most expensive beggars in the world. And I'm going to explain it so people don't run, run, run off with what I've said without knowing the context. Once you have cancer, you don't have access to funds. Even if you have a salary, for how long will they continue to pay you? You've got a family, you've got rent, you've got bills to pay. 
at a point, there will be none. You've got people who have supported you in the initial stage. At a point, they too will stop. So the financial place of a cancer patient is not short term, except the disease is actually treatable short term. Therefore, anybody who lives with cancer falls into the category of the most expensive beggars in the world. Because there is no country that will, can pay for us, for all our bills, for the rest of our lives. There is none. If you have a house, you will lose your house. If you have, especially if you are a young person, because you don't have the income to pay the mortgage anymore. And you won't have it because you live with cancer, which means you take treatment. You are always in the hospital. You have three days off this week. You may not have three days off next week. No employer is going to employ you with those. So with that in context, I just wanted to make sure I explain that in context. Once you've got an understanding that this is your reality, then we start to look at what common cancer does. First and foremost, our first primary goal is to create awareness. That is, ensure knowledge is out in the open space. You get the facts of cancer, different cancers. We get speakers from all over the world. Our focus primarily is low middle income countries. And I'm in Nigeria, so let's use Nigeria as most of them. But I also have speakers from the global community, depending on what we're doing. So this year is World Cancer Day. I have somebody in a, in an organization that... Um, is into patents. And when I say patents, is patents are the cheaper version of our cancer drugs. Our cancer drugs are produced by the big seven or big five. I can't tell you how they are called. One is called big seven, one is just five. I don't know which of the one it is, but they're the biggest pharmaceuticals. And once they produce a drug, it takes a certain number of years before it can be sold at a patent price, which is they take the, the content and now make it at a cheaper price. Until that is done, you cannot access the drugs, which means mm -hmm. that only countries, only people in developing countries can access that drug at the rates the patent, the, the organization has put it. When it becomes patented, then it can be sold in low middle income countries because the organization will now give out, provide the licenses for pharmaceuticals to now sell it. There's a difference. I actually serve as a community advisory panelist for the medicine patent pool. That is fundamentally what I'm trying to drive. That's why I agree to serve mm. there because if we get more patents in and they are in the market, it helps people access the drug. One of our biggest drugs is what they call trastuzumab. Trastuzumab is taken by almost, I don't know if I pronounced it, pronounced it properly, but you take it like that. The, non, the easier name of it is Herceptin. Almost all okay. patients that have breast cancer at some point take mm -hmm. it. Some of us live on it. In some countries, it's very expensive. So if it's very expensive, until it gets to patent price, you can't. I think it's now in the patent pricing group. So hopefully we should get the patent pricing out before the end of 2024, which will automatically give a huge number of cancer patients across the world access to that. Yes, yeah. Because the World Health Organization is trying to work on access for all, access to medicines mm -hmm. for all. But until the big organizations, that's those big giant pharmaceuticals, agree to release the drugs at the price, then there's nothing we can do. So that is part of my work. Um, I am engaged in the global community on the rights of cancer patients as, a, as people, our disabilities. Because if you take cancer drugs for a long time, it has a knock-on effect on your body. Who is going to pay for you? Nobody wants to. Nobody's interested. Okay, so maybe... At this point, we need to look. I'm hoping this year to put out um, 
I, I will call it a call to action, but it's more to see how many people I can get to sign a petition asking that people who live with cancer should be allowed to access their pension. If they're not mm -hmm. going to ever work, why am I, I paid into a pension system over 2,000 pounds a month and now I can't access it and I may not live mm -hmm. till 67, but I was mm -hmm. diagnosed when I was 49. And that unfortunately cannot be because the statistics shows that I'm not going to live that length of time or I may not. And a lot of us that have it end up dying and we die in poverty. Why? Because you've taken our homes, you've taken everything, and yet we're, we're now allowed to live long. It's wrong. At least if we had those, we don't lose our homes because at least we have access to money that can pay for our mortgages. And then, do you understand? And I, yeah. I think those, so that's, a, that's a drive, one of the key things that we drive. We have um, translating, one of the biggest things is translating awareness in different languages. Currently, I want to build the Nigerian one first and then take it out and see if we can get it in other places. But the one in the Nigerian one, if I get it right, Yoruba, Ibo, and Hausa, I will see mm. if I can get um, people like the uh, Macmillan to take it on because it's required in England. We one question before you go on. So this translating the awareness, is this for... Um, cancer people that are living with cancer or is it awareness generally for people it's general who... okay okay it's general because if if i'm talking to you about cancer yeah when anytime i do an interview about cancer i try to bring somebody who has the disease and who is the medic so when the medic is saying this i am i'm as a cancer patient the cancer patient can help to explain it to somebody who might have the disease this is it or who is supporting somebody who has family that has the disease because one of the saddest things is I, I a lot of us don't realize queen elizabeth who just died our queen that just died history has it <coughs> excuse me history yes, has it yeah. that her father died of cancer so if we want to deny that's a shame. But history has it that the king, Prince Elizabeth's, Queen Elizabeth's father, mm. had cancer. So why is it that they've known about cancer how many centuries and we are still trying to address yeah. it? It just shows that there hasn't there was not a determination to address it. And now one in two people will get cancer. Yeah. And so the highest death rates of cancer will occur in low middle income countries because they can't afford it. And in in in, in high income countries, they have already got healthcare systems that give access. Hence the World Health Organization's drive for access for all, access to medicine for all. But there's, there's, so those are the things that I am, I am, I am very into. Nigeria is my home base. I will always prioritize doing yeah. things. My father still lives in Nigeria. My father is still alive, and that means a lot to me. Yes. My mother died of cancer, like I said. So mm -hmm. it is important that we don't we we work our own values in the space of running after things. I always say to people, if I don't make it, I want to make sure I've left a legacy for other people to continue. I mentor quite a lot of advocates mm. and make them learn. Well, come, let's go. I'm going on a conference now. I want you to come with me. Why? It's mm. not a lot of people say, well, you don't take me. No, I take people because when I'm not here, I want to believe they will continue the fight until mm. we've got a voice. We've struggled over the years. We're talking about cancer. And it's very sad to say that the cancer patient's voice is now just being addressed. Yeah. So how have you been addressing the medicines if you're not asking the patient? How do mm. you know their exact needs or the impact of your drugs? If you're All you're doing is giving us questionnaires. Mm. Mm. I've got to give mm. you a lot of things. <laughs> you know that I'm here, I'm just going, because mm, there, there, there are a lot of things you said that, 
I didn't even realize, you know, even the aspect of pension, it makes sense, but something that you just, you know, you just don't think about. But, I, you know, I'm just so grateful to you for coming on this podcast because there's a lot you've talked about that we kind of go, yeah, that makes sense. That's so true. And these are things that should just be, but they're, you know, they're not being thought about or not being dealt with. So, um, Denise, in terms of um, the people that you're, you know, that you focus on a lot, because I know you've talked about the cancer, you know, cancer patients themselves, those living with cancer, and what about um, the awareness in terms of people being diagnosed? Do you work? Do you do anything in that area as well? Just we support, kind of, we, okay, so we support the the process of diagnosis. Oh. So if, for instance, we have a patient that has been told they've got cancer and they need somebody to be with them, we'll, have, we'll find somebody anywhere in Nigeria. We'll find you somebody yeah. to go with you. Um, if there's funding, we start to tell you, there's funding here, access this, try this, call this person, call that. Because our community is still quite small, even though it's large. It caters for a very large group of people, but it's a very small community. So you can always call around to find who can help, where they can help. Um, a few people have turned to getting funding globally from places like GoFundMe. Like I said, which is why I used, when I said cancer patients are the most expensive beggars, people think I say it with a careless song. But you can't afford the payment. My okay, my treatment costs. I I cannot. I'm sure it cannot be less than ten thousand five hundred. Ten thousand two hundred mm. every three weeks. Mm. Who can afford that? Yeah. yeah. So mm. let's let's not lie about yeah. the challenges that the people face, and then we also help you with things like um, people just call and say, um, "I just want someone to talk to." And most of the time, my team will say, what's the issue? Um, it's not me. I don't have cancer. I just want to talk to someone. And I immediately know it's a family member who has broken down and they don't know what to do. And then I have to walk them through. Okay, come on now. Let's go. Let's believe. Let's trust. Okay, let's keep going. What are the plans? Where are we? Who is the, who is the person helping you? And, you know, we start to work on that. Um, we have... Um, people that need funding wherever we can I will find somebody who can help raise okay like for instance at, at some point at the end of last year people were looking for mascotomy bras I hope I said it right but it's the bras for those who have had breast cancer and okay breast mascotomy bras yeah yeah and um, I knew people that had it so I just referred them to people that had it that's what I mean about the community yeah. I knew people that had it so we can find I, I always try to say to people, and this is where I, I hope cancer organizations, and not just cancer, but global organizations, always remember you cannot do it all. So partnerships with other people that can do it helps us to help more people. I am good at the awareness. I have television access. So I have an awareness television program almost every week, which allows me to bring in different people in the spectrum from survivors to doctors to organizations to the government or to talk about it, talk about cancer and let the people of that of Nigeria, where I come from, know what's going on. In the mm. same way, those same videos are all on YouTube so that anybody can go there. But it's just important that a lot of people go on it, watch it, but don't say anything. And the more you talk, the more you either like and share, the more chances are more people know, oh, this resource is available because the resources are there and they are consistent. But if you don't, if you don't access it and share it with people, then you're not helping us to change the narrative. And the best way to reduce the cancer deaths in the world is through the awareness program, is through the advocacy, is through this videos these conversations because by doing that you are helping people to say oh i've got a consistent headache oh i've got a consistent stomach ache yeah. what's the reason i have diarrhea oh my goodness 
you go to the doctor, you give you medicine, you come back, you go back, you come back, you go back. You come. Once you've gone back a few times, you need to start asking the doctor, excuse me, doc, it's not like that now. Stop, stop, stop. Yeah. I want you now to check and make sure you rule out that I don't have cancer. Because cancer is an everyday illness, which people mm. don't know. It's not, it's not a sickness that comes from the... No. If you have a headache, it can be cancer. If you have diarrhea, it can be cancer. If you have constipation, it can be cancer. So if if everyday illnesses are cancer, then the faster we understand that we can solve it. Another thing that a lot of people are not aware of is that cancer is in... We are all born with cancer cells in our body, all human beings. The question is, does it does it activate so if it activates and it activates in stage one then it's under control whatever it is if it's a tumor a small tumor in your breast they just remove it they burn that part off kill that cell that's it your life is back to normal no change no nothing but you see a lump that's very small instead of having to address that small you wait it gets very big and it goes you're still running around you've already let it get worse and that is what mm. cancer cells are they are actually in your body. You're born with cancer cells. Some activate, some don't. One in two people will get cancer from 2023. So what does that tell you? If you have four people in your house, two people may get it. So don't, don't run and hide, put your head in the sand and say, it's not mine. I've got constipation. Or you say, I've got uh, diarrhea. What's, and then you say, no, it's um, one of Nigerian sicknesses. They call it Jedi Jedi, I think. Okay, yeah. Mm. yeah. And meanwhile, you just snip at that and then stop yourself from getting colorectal. Do you understand what I mean? And it's just yeah. so sad because they are they are easy to treat if they mm -hmm. are found at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you so much. I think you know that that the point you've raised are really important. I'll go back to that issue of. If you, if you have something that you keep going to the doctor and they're not finding a solution, don't stop. Just make sure that you get to the root of it. I think that's so important. And we could see that from your own story. It's a case of don't just give up and say, okay, yeah, the doctor said I'm fine, so I'm fine. If you don't feel fine, you know yourself, you know your body, keep going. And the whole aspect of being, you know, just when you notice something is not right, go for help or, and check your, you know, we just need to keep checking ourselves. We need to check our bodies. And once you notice something, go, go and see a doctor. Don't stay in denial. I think that's so important. And you've made the point. So, you know, so truly that if it's picked up quickly, then there's a solution. Most times there is a solution. It can be held. And, uh, you know, but it's when you leave it for so long, then that's when there's a pro that can be a, a, a potential problem. So thank you so much. I just because I know we're almost getting to the end now. One of the things that I, I want to come back to is you how you started working with the counselor. You started working with the counselor five about five years into living with cancer. That's correct, isn't it? So what advice would you give people now? So somebody that has just been diagnosed or somebody, you know, whether you've just been diagnosed, whether you've been living with it, you know, would you say start immediately to work with a counselor or start, you know, what, what advice would you give? A lot of people stick, you know, in the cancer world, there's something called stigmatization. And people say, no, you shouldn't say that, but it's true. Well, it's cancer is not my portion, it's not this. There's a reason why people don't want to be identified with cancer. Because a lot of cultures have a lot of issues around cancer. And they don't, you can't marry this person because they have cancer in their family. You can't do this. It's a standard thing. And that, I think, is the fundamental reason why we get to the point of stigmatization. If you have cancer, I wouldn't use myself as a starting point because I went into it telling God, you know what, whichever way you're going, let's go it together. But that is because I always say all of us have some form of faith in our subconscious. Mm. That's true. And we believe in some God in our subconscious. And we revert back at the point of cancer. Mm. 
So you've got to first find that. Second thing then becomes, once you see you cry a lot, because when it, let's use the UK. If you have cancer in the UK, you start to cry a lot. You start to go into depression. Yes. Don't deny you're not going to depression. Don't bother. It's not worth it. Because it is the skill sets to navigate through that you require. And they, the counselors are the only people that can help you. I am not being funny. When I was at that point, I, I didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. sat down there and I was like, you know what? She said to me, how are you today? I said, I'm fine, thank you. With my always, I'm always smiling. I refuse to be sad. And she just asked a question. I just started crying. Then you started Why? crying, because that yeah. Because was already inside. And it yeah. took me four sessions of saying hello to her to stop crying. Hmm. When she talks to me. When I went back, I had a break from her because I, I come off for one year and then if I'm not well, good again, I go back in. First thing I did, I started crying again. This was mm. two years ago. This was last year. Why? Because I found myself, as a result of the drug, in excruciating pain and I could no longer walk. And I can't recall. Mm. I had to call my children and say to them, you know what? I'm not sure I'm ready to fight anymore. If this is what it is, I don't want it. But as soon as I saw my consultant, she got me straight back into my counselor. Between the two of them, they were like, well, Denise, it's the pain. It's the pain. It's the legs. Okay, fine. But you can't say we've got under control. Okay, so what are we going to do to get your brain back? Mm -hmm. See, they had to help me to work my brain back. Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm. I was. Mm -hmm. And that is through my counselor. Mm -hmm. That is through the way they talk to me. When I'm in down and out and I have to see a consultant that is not my consultant, I now say, can I have their comment when my consultant is in? Because you have to also have a relationship with the person you are the talking relationship. to. Relationship, yes. And yes. that makes a significant difference in how you are now. Because yes. you are vulnerable at your highest level mm. of vulnerability. Mm. So just mm. let it go. Don't try and make out I'm very strong. Me, I'm not strong. People say you are strong. That is your opinion of me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I live mm -hmm. on what is God's opinion of me and what mm -hmm. is my opinion of me. Mm -hmm. and when Very important. I, can't do yeah. it, I know I can't do it. And yeah. I say I can't do it. There is no cycle I do. Every cycle I do within a cycle of three weeks, one or two days within those two, that period, I will cry. Because the pain is much. And now, because my daughters, my daughters help me and look after me. So they, they will soon stop looking after me. But for now, they are. I find that they help me to take my granddaughter straight away from me. So she doesn't see me crying because I'm very close to her. Mm. And take her away. And then just sit with me and just let me cry. Yeah. Because there's no, you can't do anything for me. The best mm -hmm. is to the water and sit there quietly and let me cry because you can't help me. So when it goes to cancer patient, cancer, I'm begging all cancer patients across the world, if you hear this, a cancer patient, cry. Don't be superhuman. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not going to get you anything. If anything, when you let it out, you accept where you're going, you can mm -hmm. fight. Because you will mm -hmm. then know how to get the support you require as and when. Those are the only times you will get it. Any other time you won't get it. Wow. You know, and I'll even add to that, that when, you know, if you're supporting a cancer patient, let them cry when they, when they need to cry as well. Because that's important. Because I think it's almost sometimes you find that guilt is put on. Oh, don't cry. It's almost like a sign of weakness. It's not. It's actually strength, acknowledging your emotions. It is a huge strength. And I love the way you've brought out this emotional aspect of it because there's a stigma attached to emotion. It's almost like you're weak if you cry, but you're not. And there's something you said, Denise, that I love so much. And it's the fact that, yes, I, I see you and say, gosh, Denise, you're a strong woman. But the important thing is forget about what people see. You know yourself. 
And I think that's so important. So you identify, yes, at this point I'm strong, but today I'm not. And it's acknowledging that and doing something about it. So, you know, honestly, Denise, I, I, you know, I'm so, so grateful for you to come to really open up um, and open yourself up to us. And, you know, I've learned so much and I'm sure people listening have learned so much, even how to support people, how to support friends, what to say, being careful of, you know, a narrative. And it's, you know, I talk about this a lot, especially when I'm working with leaders in organizations, but really bringing it to, um, you know, I, somebody that is a friend or someone you're supporting, it makes such a difference. And also for people living with cancer, you can see how the importance of actually guarding your own mental state. What are you thinking? Identifying what your thoughts are. And because our, our brain is just such an interesting organ. There are times that you can't take control of it yourself. And that's when you need the right support. And, and it's identifying what that right support is. It might not be your friend. It might not be your relation. It might not be your, your, your child. It, it might be somebody external, like Denise has explained. It could be a Even counselor. Your neighbor. Sometimes it's her daughters or your neighbor. Exactly. But it's really identifying the right person and making sure that it's not the wrong one. When the wrong ones are coming with their advice, no, protect yourself from that. That's so important. One so, thing it says so, that you should always get the correct circle of your support network. And all your support networks serve different purposes. So that wherever you need them, you are accessing the right person. It's very key. A lot of people don't, I don't know if that explains, I hope I've explained it well. But some yeah, people, it makes sense. When you, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, it makes absolute sense. And I think even even you know with cancer patients yes but even outside you know the the um cancer patients life because it could yeah. even be you as a person you need to know what your different associations or relationships serve and really you know making the most of it and also for you as a person where where do you give what are you giving and just paying attention to what you're doing, you know, how you're supporting somebody or actually not in terms of what you say and what you do. So I think we, we've all got that responsibility, um, you know, for ourselves, but also, you know, in terms of what we give and what we take as well. So no, thank you so much for that. So I'm going to put a link in the description to the charity. And um, Denise, what else, is there any other, is there any Thing else that you want to say in terms of what we should be doing or not doing or paying attention to to um, as we round up this um, podcast today? Um, one thing I would like to say, and thank you very much, Maureen. It's quite a nice chat. I can't believe time has gone this far. But mm -hmm. one of the things I want everybody to know is your body speaks to you. Mm -hmm. Your brain speaks to you. Your emotions speak to you. And one day, you will come across cancer. So don't let cancer be the boss. Ooh, Take control. Like that. You will win if you are actually aware. And that's why it's you have to be aware of you, for you to be able to be aware of what's going on around you. Cancer is real, but we don't have to die if we are aware. Share another thing I want to ask the world. Always help. Every little helps. It's a Think It Tesco's advert. For me, it's together we fight, together we win. And if we win, it's another life saved. And if we don't, we did. I say to everybody, we had a good fight. So all cancer patients, we're still survivors. <laughs> Hang in there, we're getting there. That's my stick for you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Maureen. Yeah. Thank you, thank you oh, for your Dennis, time. Thank you. Nice chat. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you so, 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 so much. Your body speaks, your brain speaks, your emotion speaks. Listen, listen and act on them. That is just so um, wonderful. Denise, thank you so 
very much for really coming and educating us and really opening yourself up for us. I am so, so grateful to you. And I, you know, really wish you all the best. And I know that God is with you. And one of the last things I will say is, I think just speaking to you just shows the importance of paying attention to your brain and being able to manage your emotions, understand your brain and being, you know, I would say rewire your brain. And you've just give us, given us a good example of the importance of paying attention, being in control of that brain. When I say being in control, sometimes it's actually going for the right help because it's that right help, like you described, that then helps you with your own thought process. It's, it's just paying attention to them and taking the right action. And the keys, we can. And from what you've described, you were told three months in Nigeria, here you are today. And, you know, what you did was take that control from cancer and say, you know what, this is my life and I'm going to leave. I'm going to be in control. And I, I truly admire you and thank God for your life and uh, looking forward to more conversations and seeing you, you know, push through through this. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maureen. Don't worry. We're holidaying together soon. <laughs> yes, we are. We are. We will have so much fun. Awesome. Yeah.